I'm square root of negative one and I've been cooped up in this house for two weeks now due to COVID-19. I can't actually go where people are, but you know, I could at least go out for a run or something. I should probably do that after I make this video. But hold up, how would I go for a run? How does running work? Let's start with the bare basics of forces in motion and then apply them to the human body and see if we can get it up and running. You might be familiar with Newton's laws of motion, but let's just make sure we're on the same page. Newton's first law, if you don't apply a force, nothing's gonna change. If you don't use any voluntary muscles for the next three hours, you're still gonna be sitting here watching YouTube on autoplay. Tough, and the laundry's not gonna have folded itself. Things don't just stay still, they also stay in motion. So if you don't catch my mind, it's gonna fall off the tape. Then second law, when you do apply a force, you get an acceleration, either speeding up or slowing down. This depends on the mass. More mass means more force needed to accelerate. May the mass times acceleration be with you, little buddy. Newton's third law, when you apply that force, whatever you're applying it on, exerts the same equal and opposite force back on you. So when I run into doors, it generally hurts. But sometimes you apply a force and it doesn't just move, it twists. This is a torque. Most of the muscles in your body apply torques to your bones so that your joints can bend. Structures like this are called levers. There are three classes of levers. First class levers have an effort and load on opposite sides of the fulcrum or joint. This is like your head. Most of the weight of your head rests in front of the spine, pulling it forward. Hence, when you're sleepy, your head usually nods forwards. Muscles at the back of your neck provide a torque to keep your head upright. Second class levers have the load and effort on the same side of the fulcrum, but with the load much closer than the effort. This is like your foot if you were to step up on your tippy toes. Your weight is behind the fulcrum, where your foot touches the floor, but the muscles of your calf are even further back. Third class levers, however, are the most likely for you to think of when you think of your muscles. They have an effort and load on the same side again, but this time with the effort much closer to the joint than the load. If I were to flex my forearm, the weight of my arm and anything I was holding would be much farther from the joint than the insertion of my biceps. So why does it matter if it's a second or third class lever when the load and effort are on the same side for both? The relative distance from the fulcrum is critical to how our lever functions. The farther away from the fulcrum a force is, the greater the torque it provides. The further the effort, the less effort you need. The further the load, the more effort you need to counter it. Second class levers always give you a mechanical advantage because the effort is always farther away from the fulcrum than the load. So you will always apply less force than the weight of the object, which is why I can carry a lot more weight in a wheelbarrow than in my arm. Third class levers will always give you a mechanical disadvantage, so your biceps are really lifting much more than the weight of that dumbbell. In fact, most of the muscles in your body exert a force greater than the weight they serve to hold or move. Let's take a numerical example. Most forearms weigh about 2% of total body weight. So if we take someone my mass, or about 50 kilograms, my forearm probably has a mass of about one kilogram. It therefore weighs 9.8 newtons on Earth, which is the planet I'm filming from. Let's further say that I'm holding a five kilogram or 10 pound dumbbell in my hand, so around 50 newtons. I'm gonna say that my arm is 40 centimeters long and that its center of mass is 15 centimeters from my elbow, then the insertion of the biceps is about four centimeters from my elbow. By the torque version of Newton's laws, for me to be holding this position, I must have a net torque of zero. So therefore, the torque of my biceps pulling upwards must exactly cancel the torques of the weight of my arm and the weight of the dumbbell pulling downward. Hence, the force of my biceps times its distance from the elbow equals the force of my arm weight times its distance from my elbow plus the force of the dumbbell times its distance from my elbow. That gives us the force of my biceps at about 537 newtons or roughly 120 pounds many times the original weight so go brag about that at the gym so why make so many of our muscles third class if it's such a mechanical disadvantage well think about what you'd have to do to make them second class you'd have to have the muscle insertion farther from your elbow than the center of the mass of your arm that doesn't seem very effective to me <laughs> another result of torques is why you should always lift heavy objects with your legs, not your back. Aside from just which muscles are more effective, with your legs, you keep the mass approximately straight over the fulcrum. 
so that your leg muscles are exerting forces only slightly larger than the load. If you took the same, say, 50 pound or 20 kilogram load and lifted by bending over, you would move the weight about two feet or two thirds of a meter from the fulcrum, making the effective force of your erector spinae muscles about 700 pounds or over 3,000 newtons. It only takes 3,000 newtons to fully snap a human spine. So I don't have to do that. All right, now we have the basics done. It's time to get fancy. <laughs> Okay, kidding, we're not quite ready for that. First, let's make sure we can stand up. <coughs> Standing means you're in equilibrium, so all the forces and torques on your body cancel out both from gravity and from your own muscles. Simply, it means that your center of gravity is over your face, but not all equilibrium is stable. If I'm lying on the ground, I'm not very likely to fall over. Whereas, if I stand on one leg on my tippy toes, I'm gonna... We'll talk a bit more about potential energy next week, but for now suffice to say your equilibrium is more stable when you widen the platform for error, i.e. when you widen your base. In a stable equilibrium, if you're pushed a little one way or the other, you're still in equilibrium. Your center is still over your base. So the most effective way is to widen the region where that's true. So what happens when you get out of equilibrium? Well, you fall, but not necessarily in a bad way. Falling is the only way we get anywhere. Well, maybe not the only way, but when you walk, you're basically falling. When you walk, you swing one leg forward, causing your center to shift in front of your standing foot. You then lean forward until you are on both feet again. Then you would be in equilibrium, except that you have some momentum that continues to shift your weight forward onto your front foot. The back foot lifts up and you swing it forward, continuing the pattern. But that doesn't really explain how you move forward. We know by Newton's first law that for all your body to be moving forward, there must be a net external force pushing you forward. So what's pushing on you? The ground. Remember Newton's third law that everything pushes back? As you swing one leg forward, you are simultaneously pushing backwards on the ground with your standing foot. The ground then exerts an equal and opposite frictional force on you, pushing you forward. The maximum force applied is your weight times the coefficient of static friction, which is about 0.4 for rubber on dirt. That means I could exert about 500 Newtons of force backwards on the ground and have it match me forward before my foot started to slip. Let's step it up a bit now by running. Running is like walking, but you don't have both feet down at the same time. Before one lands, the other is already pushing off. Basically same physics, but slight differences. You often hear people say that running and walking the same distance burns the same number of calories, just in a shorter time. False. This is based on the idea that work and therefore energy expended is just force times distance. We'll talk more about that next week. Same weight, being hauled at constant speed, and same distance, therefore same energy. Running actually tends to use about 25% more energy than walking over the same distance. Why? When you walk or run, your center of gravity doesn't actually move in a straight line. When you walk, it swings up over your standing leg like an arc segment. When running, you need to be suspended in the air until the next leg hits. Think of this as lifting your entire body with each step instead of just one leg. More mass clearly takes more force to lift, which is not even in the direction of your motion. Hey, so that's all for today, but if y'all wanted me to do another video just on Shaolin monks and the weird tricks they do with physics, I could totally do that. Regardless, I will definitely see you next week for a video on work and energy in the human body. Until then, like, share, subscribe, and get off your butt and get moving. Do or do not. There is no try. <laughs>